done on time. Work! Let me introduce to you the great Victor Wooten. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
ain't hold no groove. If you ain't got no pocket, yeah. you can't hold no groove. You can't make it pay. You can't hold no groove if you ain't got no pocket.
You can't hold no groove and you can't And you ain't got no pocket You can't hold no groove And you can't make it pay Thank you very much. That's Kelly, Kelly Gravely on the drums. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks a lot. I just want to say that I'm very, very honored to be here, to be invited here uh, to the second annual bass day with all these great musicians. And there's as many great bass players sitting in the audience staring at us as there have been on stage. And I think that's great. Um, I was talking with a friend earlier, and ho hopefully no one takes this wrong, 
I only mean it in the best way, but there's something with bass players that's great that I don't quite see with some of the other instrumentalists. It seems like that I don't, maybe we've been in, all been in the background for so long that, that the, uh, we keep our egos in the background too, you know. And I think it's very cool that a lot of us can get along, we can get here and we can share and, uh, and you know, leave our egos out of it. Uh, that's a great thing and I hope, I hope all musicians can, can learn from us bass players, you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so, I will say if anyone does have any questions, you can start thinking about them now. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. I just want to say I started uh, playing bass when I was about two years old. Uh, and a lot of people think that that's really strange, but I, looking back on it now, I really don't think it's that strange. Because music, to me, to me, music's a language. I think most of us can agree to that. And, uh, and if it is a language, if we think about not learning the English language until we were two, most people would think we were kind of slow. So when I look at learning the English, uh, English language, you know, usually we pick that up, you know, before we're one. We may not be able to speak it clearly yet, but we understand it. And so to me, if we can learn the English language, which is a very difficult language, when I think about it, we can learn it, the musical language. The musical language has half as many alphabet letters in the alphabet. So it should be that much easier. The thing we have to do, and in my opinion what we need to do, is just approach music the same way we approach a language. And take all the, the, the walls and the, the difficulties uh, out of it. And just have fun with it, you know, like we do the language. Uh, we don't take our language so seriously. We just have fun with it. And if we approach music the same way, and that's all I do, that's the answer to everything I do, is I just make it as fun as possible. Um, Kelly Gravely, who's up here playing with me, is not my normal drummer. Normally I play with a guy named J.D. Blair. And uh, yeah. And, uh, and Kelly is just a longtime friend of my family's and J.D.'s, and I called Kelly uh, to sit in, and it's been fun because it's neat playing with, with different drummers, but also I, I just, I'm saying this for Kelly's sake because he's so great, because I never know what's going to happen. We don't plan sets. Um, it's all improvised. And what we're doing is communicating, just like a language. If I play something in a certain way, uh, Kelly's musicianship is that high that he knows something's getting ready to happen. He may not know what it is, but something's getting ready to happen. Um, and it's just like in a language, if my voice starts getting higher, you know I'm peaking to something. And so my point being is showing how music to me is a language, and that's all we're doing, because Kelly, and, and myself included, don't know what's happening next. And that's the fun in it, and that's what keeps it fun for me, and that's what allows me to do uh, the things that I do. Thank you. Um, going back again, I started when I was about two. I'm the youngest of five brothers. Uh, my brother Reggie is a guitar player. Roy is a drummer. Rudy plays sax and Joseph on keyboards. And uh, I was two and uh, Joseph was five playing keys and Reggie, who was only ten, was teaching us to play. And uh, at that time it was no big deal. That's just what we did. But I look back on it now and I say, golly, this guy is teaching all this stuff, you know at 10 years old. Um, and uh, since then he's been nicknamed by myself and O'Till and a lot of guys as teacher. We just call him teacher because uh, you know we're all still learning from him. I remember O'Till used to, he had a six string bass. I'm sorry, it was a six string guitar strung up like a six string bass and he would come over and he and Reggie would sit around and, and practice chords. You know, I just wish now that I had sat around with them and learned some chords. Till so great at it. But um, what I'm building up to now is my brother Reggie's here. So I'll shut up. Let's bring Reggie out. <laughs> and a lot of people who think I made all this thumb stuff up, my cover is getting ready to be blown. <laughs> 
because Reggie does all the same stuff on guitar, which is really amazing to me. So um, we're going to play another song. Uh, this is a song by a group called Return to Forever. And uh, for any of you guys that have questions, we'll get to them maybe after this song, okay? This one's called Vulcan Worlds.
tell you what we'll do. We're going to have a little, I don't know if we've ever done this in New York, Reggie, but let's do it anyway. We're going to have a little friendly, brotherly love thump off here. And that's where the guitar players thump. So in this corner, weighing in at a mere 165 pounds, playing the white Japanese made Fender Strat. Very cool, he said. My oldest brother, Mr. Reggie Arpeggio Wooten. Gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a young man in the house tonight. My little brother, ladies and gentlemen, started him when he was about two years old. He was good back then, out thumping me way back then. Got him in the house tonight. We're gonna have a little innocent thump off. I recommend you all don't try this at home. Some of the stuff you might see. But uh, we got a little Victor Wood in the house. I'm honored to be here. New York City, thank you very, very much. I'm really honored. I really am. Hey, my good friend Kelly. We're gonna have a good little thump off. You better get into a bit. Right about. Right about now. Thump ball. Thank <laughs> you. 
Reggie on the guitar. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I still lost. <laughs> After all these years. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? Yes. I saw you get this out of the way because I'm probably not the only one wondering this. Can you go over just some of the basic mechanics of how you're getting those rhythmic patterns? And at some point, can you maybe play the version of Amazing Grace that you had? printed and bass player a few months ago. Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, um, I'm going to go through it really pretty quick. Uh, good question. But a lot of the thumb stuff, I'll, I'll start with my, my right hand, my picking hand. <clears throat> Starts with something that uh, Reggie showed me when I was pretty young. And it's going down and up with my thumb. Uh, using it just like a guitar pick. So, in other words, let's say my thumb, I'm going to thumb the E string, right? What I do is I go through the E string, right, instead of bouncing, okay? And, and don't get me wrong, there's no right or wrong way. I'm just showing you how I do it, okay? So I go through, and the A string, the next string stops my thumb from, motion, from moving. And that right there leaves me in the perfect position to come back up. All right? If I bounced, I'm already up, so I've missed the opportunity. So I go through. And it's almost just like holding a pick, except I'm using my thumb. Just about any guitar player can do it. All right? Then I just practice everything I've ever played. The thing that I, I want to stress is when I practice with my thumb, um, I try to practice playing everything I've ever played with my thumb. That way I'm not just locked into funk in the key of E whenever I use my thumb. Because the thumb is just a way to hit the string. It doesn't dictate the music that you have to play. It's just a way to hit the string. It shouldn't hinder your, your fretting hand. So that's where I start, down and up. Okay, I'd already been thumbing and plucking. Right, thumb, pluck. So I put the two together. Thumb down, thumb up, pluck. Ah. Now, where to a lot of you that may sound fast, I'm not moving any faster than that. But when I go down and up, it doubles it. When I add the plug, makes it into a triplet. So I can play the fast runs, fast licks, or whatever you call them, without having to move that fast. And, uh, and that's what allows me to pull it off most of the time. The key is staying relaxed and using the economy of motion. The next thing I do is I'll pluck more than once. Instead of plucking with just my index finger, I'll pluck index, then middle. So I could go thumb, index, middle. Thumb. <laughs> Right? Or all three different strings. Right? Now I can take a step back and go thumb down, thumb up, two plucks. So thumb down, thumb up, index middle. as fast as I have to move to do that. It just takes a little bit of coordination. Um, <laughs> what did I say? So that's these three fingers on my plucking hand. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and throw this in. I also make sure that I can do this in any order, any combination, and also all on one string. 
So in other words, I want to be able to do, you know, two or three. The same way your fingers can move around, you know, switch strings, I want to have that same dexterity with my thumb and my fingers. So I make sure I can do all of that on a G string. Down, up, pluck, pluck. D string. A. E. Right? Then it's start applying notes, because right now my left hand's not doing anything. Right? All you have to do is press notes down. And then you can make it as melodic as, as, uh, as you know how. And, uh, okay? So the next thing is incorporating the left hand, right? And that's with hammer-ons. One day when I was at home, I started figuring out, well, how many notes can I get from one down up motion? And I started applying hammer-ons. So I'll just show you one way to do it. I, what I call open hammer pluck. Because a lot of times I'll hit an open string, hammer a note, then pluck a note. Open, hammer, pluck. And uh, out of all the things that I've, I've figured out how to do, I like this one the best because it's so versatile. Um, I didn't mean to take this long on this question, but I'll show you a bunch of different ways of using open hammer pluck. This is all the same technique, but notice how different it sounds, okay? Open hammer. And basically all I'm doing is changing the notes and maybe the rhythm, but it's still all triplet patterns, okay? All right? All right? A three note pattern. You can change any of the notes. It's all the same. It's just choosing different notes. So I'll leave it there. I'll just throw in one other hint. I'm only hammering once so far. Okay? You take it from there. Oh, yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Another question? How you doing, Victor? I was wondering, um, the upright bass is a couple of hundred years old, and guitar and piano go way back, and the drums are primitive. But the electric bass is a new instrument. It's less than 50 years old, and mm -hmm. there are people who play electric bass who are older than it. I was, I was wondering, what do you say to people who say that you're breaking tradition by playing techniques like harmonics and thumping and, and tapping when the instrument is not old enough to have a tradition? Well, I'd probably say okay and <laughs> lay, leave it at that. <laughs> but you know, to give you a better answer than that, I, would, I could also say, I'd ask them, what, okay, well, what is tradition? And whatever they said, I could show them when that wasn't traditional. You know what I mean? You know, a lot of us who are trying to keep it bebop, I can show you when bebop wasn't tradition. You know, the people that were playing bebop, they were stretching. They're living on the edge. That's where the ideas come from. You know, I mean, when the car was invented, the guy who invented the horse and buggy was probably really mad, <laughs> right? But that's evolution. You know, when you're two-year-old, you're this tall. Now you're this tall. You grow. It's what it's about. It's totally what it's about. Um, but everyone's allowed to their opinion, so I wouldn't try to change it for him. You know, he wanted to think that that's fine with me. Next question. I was just wondering if you could share with us briefly, as you say, uh, something about your solo technique. In other words, when you're soloing over chords, whether improvisationally or you're writing, mm -hmm. um, what are you thinking? Are you thinking modally? Or are you just thinking, this sounds good? Right. You know? I wonder if you could talk about that. The, be the best answer is, is I would turn the question back to you. Remember when I said music is a language? Okay, I get a lot of people who say, I just don't know how to improvise. And my answer is that you improvise that question. Right? Unless you rehearsed it and you repeated it verbatim, you improvised it. So what were you thinking about? Were you thinking nouns, pronouns? Did you count the syllables? You know, how many conjunctions did you use? You know what I mean? You say what you feel, but it's because your vocabulary is big enough. You have a lot to choose from. So musically, it's, for me, it's about building up the vocabulary so big and so well that you don't have to think about it anymore. Think about the things you're the best at. You don't think about them. When you do think about them, it's like walking. You start thinking about your trip, you know? So my goal is to not have to think about it. Uh, there's something, when I do have to think about it, there's like something's wrong, you know? Um, <clears throat> but as much as possible, learn the rules, learn your theory, learn how to read all that kind of stuff. Because just like English, think about it if you couldn't read it. You know, so it shows you how important it is in music also. Knowing the theory uh, is important because maybe we're playing these songs every night and I'm playing the same thing every night because that's what I'm hearing, right? So I can go, okay, what chord is this? All right, the rules say I can do that. And then I can do it methodically, technically, until it becomes part of me. You know, I can just approach it uh, theoretically until I can hear it. And then I don't have to think about that anymore. So hopefully I'm not thinking too much. Uh, that's my goal. That's a short, well, it wasn't that short, but the easy answer is I'm trying not to think. I'm trying to feel. The same way when you talk, you say what you feel. I'm trying to play what I feel. You're welcome. Okay. Yes. I wanted to know, like, if you wanted to give a young player advice on what to listen to, like, if you had like your own treasure trove of albums, like which would you recommend every bass player here? There's probably not anything I wouldn't recommend, really. Um, it's really hard for me. It would be hard for me to pick anything. I mean, I mean to pick something for someone else. I'm really into letting people do what they choose to do. You know what I mean? Um, because if I gave you what I listen to, it may not be what you want to listen to. Um, I would just recommend that people listen to as wide a variety as possible, especially the things you don't like. Because a lot of times that's where you may learn the most. If you're only finding out the things you do like, then you're missing half the picture, is the way I look at it. A lot of times when you break through and listen to those things and dissect the things you don't like, you end up understanding them a little bit more. 
and a lot of times you like them a little bit more. But um, I, I will go ahead and say, um, for me, I listened, I listened to uh, just about everything Jocko did, everything Stanley did, everything Larry Graham did, and everything I could get my hands on from Bootsy. That was my upbringing, though, you know, listening to soul music. Oh, and James Jamerson. But I didn't know who James Jamerson was at the time, you know. But it was soul, you know, just laying it down. But those are probably not the things I would recommend to people. Because if, if I say, or oh, listen to Jocko, listen to Stanley, then you're going to come out just, you know, playing like that. But if I say, well, listen to Paul McCartney, you know, listen to Jamerson, you know, listen to Kachow and all these guys, then you'll learn how to groove and then you will evolve into the other stuff. So if I had to say anything, I would try to find the most basic grooving stuff to get everybody to listen to. Because that's what's going to keep you a working basis. You know, this other stuff is just icing on the cake. You know, and like real icing, it doesn't last long by itself. You got to have that cake with it. You know? mm -hmm. We'll get through these couple more. I was wondering, when you ever sit down and compose um, a piece, what format do you think of or where do you start? Because it just ends up so complicated. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's about composing. I don't have one way that always works. Some of my favorite tunes, a song I did on my latest CD called The Loneliest Monk. That song just came to me, and I hope people understand what I mean. I was driving actually through New York. I was moving some furniture in a big rider truck. I had driven all the way from Nashville. And a lot of times when I get tired, my mind starts to do its own thing. And a lot of times ideas will come through. Um, it takes practice to learn how to control that state. It's almost like when you're almost asleep, your mind starts to go into another place. If you can learn to control that, there's some great places that it can take you. So when I get tired, I pay attention to what my mind's doing. And a song started to come. And I was with my wife at the time. I said, write this down. And it just happened. Those are some of my favorite songs because I don't really feel like there was much effort. I almost don't even feel like I wrote them. You know, I feel like I, I was just lucky enough to receive them. But sometimes when I'm stuck, I'll just start playing with the tape recorder. It may be anything, you know. You know, it may be, it may be. I have no idea what it was, but I'm just playing anything. But when I go back and listen to it, it may get, I may get ideas from that. Or also, as I'll put on some other music. Um, because there's a way of ripping off other music without <laughs> technically ripping them off, but they can give you ideas, you know. So I'll put on stuff that I like, and start, I'll start feeling good, and then I'll, I'll get more ideas. So that's some uh, good things I do. Thanks. Yeah. That bass guitar, is that, uh, that design, that, the guitar that you're using now, what encouraged that design? Was that something that you came up with? And is there any spiritual tie to it? Well, it, it's just a yin-yang symbol with the two dots. And um, people ask me about spirit a lot. And to me, I, I'm not, I didn't mean to go to this place, but to me, there's nothing that's not spirit. Where did everything come from? So how can it not be spirit? There are things and people that don't know that it's spirit. I do know it. That's all. And so this is just a great symbol that shows opposites, but together they make something that's beautiful. You know, you can see them as separate, you know, parts, or you can put it together and see how it's one, uh, one thing. And to me that, you know, it just shows a oneness or, or balance is another way of putting it. I just like the symbol. You know, I see it on surfboards, I see it everywhere, but I've never heard a negative explanation of it. So I like it. So I, I'd just like to say also, before we run out of time, I've got to do this. There's a, been a guy that um, has been, um, if, I had to, if I had to say who was my favorite bass player, and it would be hard for me to say who, because I like, I like what everybody does. To me, you know, if you took a newborn baby and put them on the instrument, they're going to get sounds out of it that I can't get out of it. And that's beautiful. So everyone is the best, the way I see it. But there's one guy that sticks out and has always stuck out to me. 
And uh, I'm going to get him out to play. You guys know him. He's been making a great name for himself over the years, and I'm so happy for him. I've known him for years. His name is Otil Burbridge. So if Otil could come out and play a song. We're going to let Otil go a little bit on this song. Once again, I just really want to say thank you all uh, for being here and for allowing us to be here. It's really a great thing that we can all get here and, in, and enjoy music from the bass perspective. Just don't do 
Till Burbage. Thanks a lot.
Kelly Gravity, Reggie Wooten. My name is Victor Wooten. Thanks a lot. One of the uh, one of the bass players that really kind of got me into expanding on on the thumb technique was Larry Graham, and it kind of happened to me by accident when I was learning music uh, that my brother Reggie was showing me. And one of the neat things that Graham used to do with his thumb is he would just stay on one note uh, when he was playing with Sly Stone. He'd uh, play something like this. And when I was younger, I had a hard time making that groove. I really had a hard time making it steady and, and, and giving it a, a deep pocket. So my brother Reggie gave me the idea of trying to go down and up with my thumb. That way I could use half the motion. Instead of having to do this a lot, I could just so. And that was the start for me uh, into taking the thumb thing in my own direction. Um, another thing that Larry Graham used to play was a... Uh, you know, thank you for letting me be myself with Sly and the Family Stone. An amazing bass line. And, um, uh, it's it's another thumb thing in E, but the thing to listen to for that is just the sheer grooveness of it. Um, and that was one of the things that I was lucky enough to get introduced to at a young age from Larry Graham. Another thing that uh, a good friend of mine, Anthony Jackson, used to play. <laughs> Money, money, money. A famous bass line and a great one that I love to go back and listen to today. Um, uh, another good one, let's think, uh, Stanley Clark. If I were to pick one from Stanley Clark, it would be kind of hard, you know. Um, I got into Stanley Clark when I was young. And he's just got so many amazing bass lines. But one that, I, that I'll just pick on, um, I liked it because it, it, it taught me the use of, of chords using open strings. And it, it wasn't until I was much older until I realized what he was doing, but... Uh, open string there. Lopsy Lou. So go back and find those things and build up from there. And, uh, and you'll have a deep, deep foundation. <laughs> 